You see, actually, I do not teach, you know, karate because I do not believe in styles anymore. Human beings have three arms and four legs. We will have a different form of fighting. sound too philosophical but it's an acting acting or acting and acting if you you've lost me <laughs> i have <laughs> the legend of bruce lee the ultimate master of martial arts is veiled in mystery and legend stories of his lightning fast speed and deadly accuracy still give goosebumps to even the toughest fighters and few know lee's skills as well as the renowned boxer mike tyson in a rare moment of honesty Tyson shared a chilling truth about Lee's speed, calling him a killer among martial artists. But why was this revered fighter given such a nickname? And what does it say about the hidden depths of his incredible talent? If you're curious to learn more, let's dive into the details. Bruce Lee, the king of martial arts, was celebrated for his incredible speed in both punching and kicking. How did he manage to boost the velocity of his strikes during his training? He placed immense focus on developing swift hands and executing punches without telegraphing his intentions. Being able to strike before an opponent could react gave him a significant edge in combat, and Bruce Lee was determined to be the fastest. The quest for speed was always on his mind during his training. Tyson once said in an interview, Bruce Lee is a real force. He inflicts damage and gets out unscathed. He was praising Lee's speed and lifestyle. Lee's introduction to martial arts began with his father teaching him Wu-style Tai Chi basics. As a teenager in Hong Kong, he found himself in street fights due to gang conflicts. However, it was a study of Wing Chun that shaped his martial arts journey. At 16, Lee started training under IP Man after a defeat by rival gang members. IP's classes were varied, covering form practice, sticking hand drills, wooden dummy techniques, and free sparring. Lee also explored other Chinese martial arts styles like Northern Praying Mantis and Southern Praying Mantis. Under Brother Edward, coach of the St. Francis Xavier's college boxing team, Lee honed his skills. His hard work paid off when he won the Hong Kong School's Boxing Tournament in 1958, defeating the reigning champion Gary Elms with powerful knockdowns. And the story doesn't end there. Upon arriving in the United States, Lee became enthralled by the legendary heavyweight boxing champion, Muhammad Ali. He immersed himself in all these techniques, particularly his mesmerizing footwork, which he adeptly integrated into his own style. In 1964 and 1968, Lee showcased his remarkable martial arts skills at the prestigious Long Beach International Karate Championships. Luckily, the latter event boasts excellent video footage, allowing us to witness Lee's awe-inspiring abilities firsthand. With lightning-fast strikes aimed at his opponent's vulnerable spots, Lee displays his unmatched speed and precision. He even stuns the audience with his famous one-inch punch, effortlessly knocking down multiple volunteers. Blindfolded, Lee fearlessly engages in intense chi sao drills, searching for weaknesses in his opponent while delivering powerful punches and executing flawless takedowns. The intensity rises as Lee enters a full-contact sparring match, both fighters wearing protective leather headgear. Staying true to his Jeet Kune Do philosophy, Lee demonstrates his mastery of efficient movement by using footwork inspired by Ali, gracefully dodging his opponent's strikes. His lightning-fast backfists and straight punches swiftly counter any attack. Lee's stop-hit sidekicks are precise, halting his opponent's advances. With remarkable agility, he executes sweeps and head kicks, leaving his opponent astonished. Despite relentless attempts to land a blow, Lee's opponent is left frustrated and empty-handed. Even when a spin kick comes close, Lee effortlessly counters it, showcasing his unmatched skill and lightning-fast reflexes. Black Belt magazine aptly described the action in 1995 as fast and furious, highlighting Lee's unparalleled abilities that rival his on-screen performances. In 1964, Lee met Taekwondo master Jun Gu Ri at the championships. While Ri shared the sidekick intricacies, Lee introduced the concept of the non-telegraphic punch. Ri adopted Lee's acupunch technique, a lightning-fast punch revolutionizing American Taekwondo. Lee also popularized the oblique kick, later known as the g tag or intercepting kick in Jeet Kune Do and mixed martial arts. Bruce Lee, the true master, Lee was a versatile master blending various fighting styles, with a particular interest in grappling. He surrounded himself with top judo practitioners like Fred Sato, Jesse Glover, Taki Kimura, and others. These experts not only trained with Lee but also shared their knowledge, creating a mutual exchange of skills. After befriending Jean LaBelle on the set of The Green Hornet, Lee seized the chance to broaden his skills. He offered to teach LaBelle striking arts in exchange for grappling techniques, resulting in a blend of judo, catch wrestling, and Lee's own style in his Tao of Jeet Kune Do. 
Jesse Glover mentioned that Lee had reservations about Judo's effectiveness in certain situations, feeling it lacked quick control over opponents. Despite this, Lee was introduced to an Asato Gari technique, acknowledging its potential while disliking its reliance on grappling. While in Seattle, Lee concentrated on anti-grappling tactics to thwart takedowns, preferring to keep the fight upright. Nonetheless, he expressed a desire to integrate Judo into his fighting repertoire. He skillfully incorporated Asato Gari along with throws, arm locks, and chokeholds from Judo into his groundbreaking martial arts philosophy, Jeet Kune Do. Lee's thirst for knowledge was unquenchable. He expanded his expertise in ground fighting by learning grappling moves from the esteemed Hapkido master, Ji Han Jae. Though he had doubts about the effectiveness of grappling in action choreography, Lee didn't hesitate to demonstrate his grappling skills in his films. From taking down Chuck Norris in Way of the Dragon to submitting Samu Hung in Enter the Dragon, Lee showcased his prowess in grappling matches. And who can forget his epic showdown with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in Game of Death? Lee's martial arts mastery extended beyond striking techniques, and his admiration for the Great Gamma's training routine only enhanced his grappling abilities. Growing up in Hong Kong's vibrant culture, Lee's love for street fighting was deeply influenced. In the mid-20th century, amid rising crime rates, martial arts became a means of self-defense. Lee fearlessly participated in rooftop fights, blending techniques from various schools to create his own hybrid martial arts style. Upon his return to Hong Kong in the early 1970s, Lee's reputation as the fastest fist in the East led locals to challenge him to street fights, eager to test their skills against the legendary martial artist. Though criticized by the press for his involvement in these street fights, controversy only added to Lee's allure in the world of celebrity gossip. Standing at 172 centimeters and weighing 64 kilograms, Bruce Lee was renowned for his remarkable physical fitness and strength. Following his iconic showdown with Wong Jack Man in 1965, Lee decided it was time for a martial arts training makeover. He felt many martial artists were neglecting their physical fitness, so he made a comprehensive plan focusing on strength, endurance, cardiovascular health, and flexibility. Lee blended traditional bodybuilding methods to bulk up without compromising speed or agility. He stressed the significance of mental and spiritual preparation alongside physical conditioning for martial arts excellence. Upon settling in the United States, Lee embraced a health-conscious lifestyle. He delved into nutrition, diving deep into health foods, protein shakes, and vitamin supplements. He quickly realized that sculpting a top-tier physique mirrored maintaining a high-performance sports car. Both required quality fuel. Lee understood that consuming the wrong foods would only slow him down and diminish his performance. He ditched baked goods and refined flour, considering them empty calories. Instead, he savored Asian cuisine, relishing the blend of vegetables, rice, and fish. Surprisingly, Lee avoided dairy, opting for powdered milk. In meditation, it was a non-negotiable part of his daily routine, always topping his agenda. Early Life Bruce Lee, the iconic martial artist, had a captivating background that influenced his remarkable journey. Born as Lee Jin Fan, he was destined for greatness from the beginning. His father, Lee Hoi Chuen, was a renowned Cantonese opera singer from Hong Kong, while his mother, Grace Ho, had mixed heritage with roots in Shanghai. In an unexpected turn of events, Bruce's parents embarked on an international opera tour in San Francisco's lively Chinatown in December 1939. It was during this time that Bruce was born on November 27, 1940, granting him U.S. citizenship under the country's birthright citizenship law. However, just four months later, the Lee family returned to their homeland of Hong Kong. The Lee family faced upheaval as World War II unfolded. In December 1941, Japan launched a surprise attack on Hong Kong, leading to a four-year occupation of the city. Bruce and his family encountered unforeseen challenges during this tough period. His lineage was a captivating blend of cultures. His maternal grandfather was of Cantonese descent, while his maternal grandmother had English roots. Adding to the mix, his maternal great-uncle was a Hong Kong businessman with Dutch, Jewish, and Cantonese heritage. Bruce's father, Li Hoi Chuen, played a vital role in shaping his son's future. As a Cantonese opera star, Li Hoi Chuen introduced young Bruce to the world of cinema from a young age. Bruce even made his debut on the silver screen as an infant, carried on to the stage in a film. Embracing his Chinese heritage, Bruce took on the stage name Li the Little Dragon, a name with special significance as he was born in the hour and year of the dragon according to the Chinese zodiac. Bruce's talent and love for acting blossomed as he grew older. At nine, he acted alongside his father in the film, The Kid, in 1950, his first leading role based on the popular comic book character, Kid Chu. By 18, Bruce had already showcased his skills in an impressive 20 films. Education was also crucial in Bruce's life. After attending Toxin School, he joined the primary school division of Catholic LaSalle College at 12. 
1956, Bruce Lee's struggles with academics led him to St. Francis Xavier's College, where Brother Edward Muss, FMS, became his mentor. His involvement in street fights prompted his parents to enroll him in martial arts training. Due to the tradition against teaching Wing Chun Kung Fu to foreigners, Lee eventually gained acceptance with the help of his friend Chung. Despite facing hurdles due to his mixed heritage, despite discrimination from some students, Lee continued his passion for Wing Chun through private training with IP man, William Chong and Wang Shen Long. In 1958, Lee emerged victorious in the Hong Kong school's boxing tournament by knocking out the reigning champion Gary Elms in the final match. Additionally, that same year, Lee showcased his talent as a cha-cha dancer, winning the prestigious title of Hong Kong's Crown Colony Cha-Cha Championship. That's when things start to get really interesting. Lee's teenage years were anything but ordinary. He was no stranger to street fights, earning a reputation as a tough fighter. In a surprising twist, he even defeated the son of a notorious triad family, but the real drama unfolded in 1958 when rival martial arts students challenged Lee's school. The tension climaxed on a rooftop where a heated showdown occurred. What seemed like a typical brawl took a nasty turn when one boy threw a cheap shot. Lee, not one to back down, swiftly retaliated, knocking out the boy's tooth. Ouch. The boy's enraged parents filed a complaint, but Lee's mother came to the rescue. She bravely took full responsibility for her son's actions, keeping the incident hidden from Lee's father. However, she had a clever plan, suggesting Lee return to the United States to claim his citizenship once he turned 18. It was a chance for him to start anew and escape Hong Kong's limited opportunities. To everyone's surprise, Lee's father gave his blessing, seeing the potential for a brighter future abroad. It seemed like Lee's journey is about to get even more exciting. In April 1959, Lee's parents took a bold step and sent him to the United States to join his older sister, Agnes Lee, who was already living the high life in San Francisco with close family friends. But Lee decided to switch things up and headed to Seattle to continue his high school education in 1959. He even worked as a live-in waiter at his sister's restaurant, showing real dedication. But wait, there's more. In early 1964, Lee made another bold move. He left university and went to live with the legendary James Yim Lee in Oakland. James Lee was no ordinary guy. He was a highly respected Chinese martial artist in the area. Together, they opened the second Jun Fan martial arts studio in Oakland, forming a powerful duo. But the story doesn't end there. Through James Lee, Bruce met the renowned American martial artist, Ed Parker, and this meeting changed his life forever. Parker was so impressed by Lee's skills that he invited him to participate in the 1964 Long Beach International Karate Championships. Lee amazed the crowd with his incredible two-finger push-ups, using only his thumb and index finger, and he did it with his feet shoulder-width apart. Now that's talent. In 1964 in Oakland's Chinatown, Lee had a controversial private match with Wong Jack Man, a direct student of Ma King Fung. Wong was highly skilled in Ching Yi Chen, Northern Shaolin, and Tai Chi. Lee claimed he faced pressure from the Chinese community to stop teaching non-Chinese students. When he refused, Wong challenged him to a fight. The stakes were high. If Lee lost, he'd have to shut down his school. If he won, he could teach anyone. However, Wong disagreed with Lee's version, saying he challenged Lee after Lee boasted about his abilities. Wong emphasized he didn't discriminate against anyone. Lee dismissed the threat, saying he wasn't intimidated by the names on a piece of paper. Witnesses included Cadwell, James Lee, and William Chen. According to Wang and Chen, the fight lasted an unusually long 20 to 25 minutes. Wang claimed Lee attacked aggressively, aiming to harm. When Wang offered a handshake, Lee allegedly tried to gouge his eyes. Wang defended himself without lethal force using concealed cufflings. According to Michael Dorgan's book, the match ended with Lee exhausted, not with a clear winner. Bruce Lee, Linda Lee Cadwell, and James Yim Lee all recall the fight lasting just three minutes, with Lee emerging as the clear victor. Cadwell characterized it as a fierce, no-holds-barred confrontation that concluded with Lee urging his opponent to yield, which he did. Lee subtly hinted at his victory in an interview prompting Wong to recount his perspective in a Chinese-language newspaper in San Francisco. However, tragedy struck at the height of Lee's career. Death On May 10, 1973, during a dialogue replacement session for Enter the Dragon in Hong Kong, Lee collapsed due to epileptic seizures and headaches. Rushed to the hospital, Doctors diagnosed him with cerebral edema, which they successfully treated with mannitol. On July 20, 1973, Lee met with actor George Lazenby and producer Ray Munchow to discuss a film collaboration. After reviewing the script of Betty Ting Pei's residence, Lee decided to rest. When he didn't show up for dinner, Chow found him unresponsive. 
Despite efforts to revive him, Lee was pronounced dead upon arrival at Queen Elizabeth Hospital at the age of 32. Lee was laid to rest at Lakeview Cemetery in Seattle, with pal bearers including Taki Kimura, Steve McQueen, and James Coburn. His untimely death led to various rumors and speculations, including allegations of murder involving triads and supposed family curses. Forensic scientist Donald Teer concluded that Lee's death was caused by cerebral edema resulting from a reaction to medication. The autopsy findings show that Lee's brain had swelled from 1,400 to 1,575 grams, a 13% increase. He had taken Equigesic, a medication containing aspirin and meprobamate, on the day he passed away, despite having used it before without issues. Although cannabis was found in Lee's stomach, there were no indications it contributed to his death. Dr. Tier dismissed such claims, calling them irresponsible and irrational. Dr. R. R. Lissette, the clinical pathologist at Queen Elizabeth Hospital, also ruled out cannabis as the cause of death during the coroner's inquest. According to a 2018 biography by Matthew Pauley, Lee's death was attributed to cerebral edema resulting from overexertion and heat stroke. Heat stroke wasn't well understood at the time, and Lee's decision to remove his underarm sweat glands in 1972 may have exacerbated his susceptibility to overheating during intense practice sessions in hot weather, ultimately leading to his demise in 1973. In a recent article from the December 2022 edition of the Clinical Kidney Journal, a team of researchers delved into the various theories surrounding Bruce Lee's passing. They concluded that his fatal cerebral edema was likely triggered by hyponatremia, a condition marked by low sodium levels in the blood. The researchers pointed out several risk factors that may leave vulnerable to hyponatremia, including excessive water intake, alcohol use, and the use of misuse of multiple drugs affecting the kidney's ability to flush out excess fluids. Lee's symptoms prior to his death closely mirrored those of confirmed cases of fatal hyponatremia. Following Lee's unexpected death, a phenomenon dubbed the Kung Fu craze swept through the Western markets. However, this craze took a rather exploitative turn, earning it the moniker Bruce Ploitation. Filmmakers in China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan wasted no time capitalizing on Lee's fame by hiring lookalikes and casting them in low-quality martial arts flicks. These actors even adopted names reminiscent of Lee's. During the 1970s, a wave of Bruce Lee-inspired figures like Bruce Lee, Bruce Lai, Dragon Lee, Bruce Long, and Bruce Lei inundated the screens, though many of their movies fell short. Despite the mediocrity, a handful of standout films emerged. Some of the most notorious Bruce Bloitation flakes include Bruce Lee, The Man, The Myth, Enter the Game of Death, Dragon Lives Again, My Name Called Bruce, Exit the Dragon, Enter the Tiger, Challenge of the Tiger, and Game of Death. The last one in particular is a rare find, blending stock footage with scenes shot before Lee's passing in 1973, although the film remained unfinished. At first glance, these movies might trick viewers into thinking they've stumbled upon undiscovered Lee treasures, but closer inspection reveals mere imitators who pale in comparison to the real martial arts icon. Despite not commonly associated with poetry or philosophy, Bruce Lee was both a poet and philosopher. While in school, he devoted himself to poetry and philosophy, even getting his work published multiple times. His university days at the University of Washington saw him exploring Asian and Western philosophies, incorporating elements from Jidu, Buddhism, Taoism, and Krishnamurti. This exploration deepened his self-awareness, recognizing martial arts as a form of self-expression for his philosophical beliefs. Lee's deep grasp of philosophy not only shaped his love for poetry, but also served as a channel for expressing his feelings. His poems, mostly compiled and edited by John Little, were described as having a darker tone than typical American works, delving into the intricacies of human emotions. Many of his verses touched on the fleeting nature of life, love, and the intensity of desires. Throughout his life, Lee remained an enthusiastic reader with a vast collection of over 2,500 books, with a significant focus on martial arts and philosophy. In his personal essay titled In My Own Process, Penned before his passing, Lee reflected on his life's purpose. He acknowledged his roles as a martial artist and actor, but expressed his ultimate aspiration to be an artist of life. Bruce Lee's incredible speed became legendary, defying conventional understanding of logic, physics, and nature. His unmatched swiftness was a result of his dedicated approach to nutrition and fitness, sculpting his body to perfection. His strikes were so swift that they seemed impossible to block, captivating anyone who witnessed them. Some believed Lee's movements were supernaturally fast, barely visible on camera. However, the reality was that his extraordinary speed required no special effects. In certain scenes, he even had to slow down deliberately to maintain realism. Such was the extent of his astonishing abilities. 
And if you enjoyed this video, feel free to give us a thumbs up and drop a comment.